Every day, technology is part of your life. Now there's Tech TV, a new television network all about technology. News and breakthroughs, games, music, health, and the hottest new products. A new network for a new world. You love technology? We know how you feel. Tech TV, television about technology. Hello, I'm Chris Perillo from Tech TV show Call for Help. Every day I guide people much like yourselves through the wonderful world of computing. And I'm Kate Patello. We're excited that you're joining us. Now, over the next hour, we hope to supply you with everything you need to know to get started with your new computer. Now, even if you're not completely new to computers, but you're still a little green, this video should get you clicking like a pro in no time. That's right. Computers can open up a world of endless possibilities, but we know it can be overwhelming at first and sometimes scary. So we're going to take you step by step through the whole process. By then, you'll be prepared to go it alone. Let's take a quick look at some of the things we'll be covering in this video. First up, we'll show you how to plug everything, including your digital camera and printer, into your computer if you have them. Then we'll take you through some basic interactions like starting up the computer and using your mouse. We're then going to guide you through all the different sections of your screen and teach you about the Windows operating system. Plus, we'll show you how to install new software and how to uninstall it when you no longer need it. And we'll cover how to open and use programs and then how to edit and alter files. Then we'll show you everything you ever wanted to know about the internet. How to get connected, how to surf the web, how to search, and how to use email. Now then we're going to talk security and a few steps that you can take to make sure your computer is connected. And last but not least, we'll show you how to properly shut down your computer without using the power button. All this and much more as we guide you through the world of computer basics. Before you can get started using your computer, you need to know a few things about how your computer works, what things are called, and where they're located. Now, don't worry, you don't need to know every single intimate detail, but it's really helpful if you at least have a grasp on the very basics. That way, if you ever have to call somebody and ask for help, you actually know what they're talking about. It won't sound like a whole lot of gibberish. So, let's get moving. My ever-so-technically-talented co-host has everything we need to get started right here. Yeah, this is great. Look at all the cords and the cables and the stuff that we have laying here on the table. All the computer and all of its parts sitting right here, not to mention all the other gadgets that we've got, they've all got to be hooked up, you know. Don't worry, it's not all that bad, not that complicated. This computer, like all computers, consists of many specialized components which work together to let you run programs to surf the web, write documents, send email, so on and so forth. And these components are defined by their function, which makes it easy. Basically, any component outside your computer's case is usually called a peripheral. Now, if you plan on adding accessories to your computer, this is a term you're going to hear often. Peripherals include things like your printer, your scanner, speakers, and all these items that you see right here. Peripherals are often broken down into two types, input and output. Input peripherals let you enter or input information into your computer. Pretty simple. For example, when you move the computer's mouse and click its buttons with your fingers, you control what the computer is doing. The same goes for your keyboard, joysticks, and whatever else you may have. Now, output peripherals handle the information that comes out from your computer. So we're talking about items like your monitor, speakers, and your printer. Now, that's the outside of the unit. Now, components located inside your computer are usually named specifically for what they are. So when information is inputted to your computer, it needs components to process the information. This is where your processor comes into play. Your processor is like the brain of the unit. It does the thinking. And it's often referred to as the CPU or central processing unit, the brain. It determines what you want and then commands your computer accordingly. Now, the CPU is measured in speed, megahertz, or gigahertz. Basically, this is just how fast your computer processes your requests and moves information in your computer. Exactly. And once the CPU receives the command from a program, it needs a place to store the information it processes. The fastest storage medium in your computer is known as RAM, or Random Access Memory. When you run a program on your computer, the CPU stores the information the program needs in memory. Now, more RAM generally means your computer runs more efficiently, even faster. 
For long-term storage, your computer uses a hard drive. The average hard drive is about 20 gigabytes, which is a lot. Now, as you add programs and store files, you use up your hard drive space. So later in this video, we'll show you how to check how much open hard drive space you have. This is really important to know if you plan on adding software applications like games, and you will. Oh, definitely, because you got to have games on your computer. And your information can also be stored on or come from CDs, which your computer reads in its CD-ROM drive. If your computer has a CD-RW drive, or what's also known as a burner, you can also copy information to the CD. Now, let's not forget about the floppy disk. Floppy disks are another type of storage, but they're becoming a little outdated, and the disks aren't even floppy anymore. And they hold a relatively small amount of data, especially when compared to the CD. Now, there are other specialized components inside your computer, such as a video card, sound card, and modem. But don't worry, unless you're upgrading, you really only need to know how to plug the cables into the back of your system. So those are the guts of your computer. Now let's talk about plugging things in. Even if you've had somebody else set up your new system, you still need to know about all the plugs and the connectors on the outside of your computer's case. Because if you plan on adding things like speakers, a scanner, and a printer, or if you need to move the computer from one location to another, or if you trip on the cord, you need to know what goes where. Every cable has a place, so if you try to plug things into the wrong spots, you can hurt something. It's pretty tough to do that, but it can happen. So let's turn this machine around, and then we're going to go over the main items you need to worry about. That's right. Now, we we've go. got all these cables sitting right here. Some of them are color-coded. Now, some of your connections on the back of your machine are also color-coded, plus they have little pictures to help you identify what items get plugged in there. Now, there are several ways to figure out what goes where beyond that. Your monitor cable looks like this. Thank you, Kate. Logically, you can look at the back of your computer and find the matching connector. Just push the cable in gently once you find it, and if the cable has thumb screws, you might want to tighten them a bit more to make a secure connection. Now, I've looked on the back, and it's kind of like a puzzle like you used to put together as a kid. you got to find the right place for it, and here it is. Here's where my video card is. That's what I plug my monitor into, and I'm going to gently push it in there, tighten the thumb screws. Next, I need to have some sound coming out of my computer, so I need to connect my speakers. Ooh, look Doctor. at my speaker. Thank you so much. This is almost like a forcep, but not really. This is my speaker cable, and you notice it's colored this nice hospital green. Boy, I'm just sticking with the doctor theme right there. Now, color-coded, I'm going to see if my back of the computer here, is that it? No, nope, that green's a little darker. Let's move a little. Oh, look at that. Look at the port right there. It's also that nice colored green, so I'm going to stick it in right in there, right in the back of the computer. Ours has a little picture next to it. It's hard to see, but believe me, it's right there. And of course, it's color-coded green, so you don't have to worry about anything. Now, as for your mouse and the keyboard, they both use what's known as a PS2 connector. These are slotted and round, so they only connect one way. You just have to find the round connector and then line up the pegs and plug them in. Of course, this one's also handily color-coded, so we'll do that. Now, another type of connection is what's known as USB. Usually, there are two of them. Here's a USB plug side by side. So here is our USB port right here. Now, USB, or universal serial bus connectors, are long and thin. They only fit together one way. It just goes right in, or it doesn't, or you flip it over. There you go. There you go. Now, a lot of printers, digital cameras, and some keyboards and mice are connecting with this USB connector. Now, they're great because they allow your computer to recognize whatever device it is automatically, and there's usually no need to install extra software. Our printer and digital camera both have these kinds of connectors. Now, depending on the brand of your computer, you may find these USB slots on the back or even on the side or in the front, but just push them in once you've lined them up. That's right. Now, if your printer doesn't use a USB connection, it probably connects through a parallel cable. Parallel connectors are wide and have many visible connector pins. And, ooh, thank you. Look at that. This is, this is a parallel cable right here. If you have a parallel printer cable, gently push it into your computer's parallel port. And this is the end I'm going to use because, of course, it's got the thumb screws to tighten it up. Find it. Ooh, look. It's got a little icon right there. It lets me know a little bit more about what's going to be plugged in there. It's a printer icon, so I'm going to plug in my printer cable here. Turn it the right way. Tighten the thumb screws gently once I get it in there. And don't worry about connecting peripherals to your computer. It's easy. Most only fit one way. If you're lucky, a peripheral may come with multiple cables. So if you're out of USB ports or your parallel ports, you can use whatever connection that you have available. Here's a troubleshooting tip for you. Now, there's a chance you might accidentally switch and connect your keyboard and your mouse into the wrong ports. Now, if this happens, the computer gets all messed up and neither one of them works. Now, don't worry. You didn't break it. Just turn the computer off and switch the cables around, then turn it back on. Now, moving 
to the front of the computer that has several buttons and indicator lights. Thank you so much, Kate. You do that so well. Now, the power button is self-explanatory. Just push it to turn your computer on, but don't turn your computer off by pushing the power button. We'll show you how to do that a little later in the video. Now, near the power button, you may have a power reset button. It's usually smaller than your power button, and it'll reset power to your computer's components. Push this button only as a last resort. It's kind of like a panic button. Now, your CD-ROM drive and the floppy disk have eject buttons, but uh, so you can you know push the disk right out of the drive. Now, if your drive gets stuck and won't eject, you can take something small like a paper clip, and you see this little hole right here? Not all drives have these, but a lot of them do. Just push it right in. Where to go? Right up here. Right in that tiny little hole. Now, you may also have a headphone jack here for headphones and a volume dial. You can use this when you're listening to a CD in the CD-ROM drive through headphones. Now, here are some basic troubleshooting tips again. Always line up your cables before you plug them in. Also, avoid using your main power button to shut down the computer. Now, everything is ready. Let's turn on our computer and see what happens. Starting or booting up your computer is relatively simple. Kate, you know why they call it booting up? I do actually, but why don't you tell us? Thank you so much for humoring me. The boot process is an old term, which means your computer is pulling itself up by its own bootstraps. Thank you, Gabby. <laughs> now, to turn your computer on, all you got to do is push the power button. Now, think about something first. When you have other peripherals, like your printer, very often they'll turn on automatically, but if they don't, turn them on before you turn on the computer. And don't forget to make sure that the monitor's on. So, if everything's connected and functioning properly, the power indicator light right here turns green. If it turns yellow, it's thinking, it's trying to come on. If it's red, something's wrong, so go back and check all your connections. Your monitor screen should flash on. Now, during this process, you're going to see several screens pop up that your computer might be running some self-tests. These aren't really for you, though. They'll check to see if the components in your computer are working. Finally, you see a Windows logo on the screen, and this means it's starting up. In most cases, Windows starts automatically when you turn on your computer, so there's nothing for you to do but wait for it to load. In fact, the only thing you need to do during your computer's boot process is to leave it alone. However, when your computer is booting up, there are a couple things you don't want to do. Never turn your computer off or unplug it during this boot process. This may mess up your system. And of course, don't unplug or plug in or turn on any peripherals during that process. In general, push the power button on, then wait for it to load. Push and wait. That's right. Push and wait. Mm -hmm. Now, today's operating systems are very user-friendly. The best-known operating system is Windows. And that's what we're going to be working with today. But there are others out there. For learning purposes, though, we're going to be using the latest version of Windows, Windows XP. All the Windows versions, 95 and newer, work pretty much the same way. So if you're using, say, Windows 95 or 98, the steps are basically the same. To control your computer, run programs, and move your files around, you're going to need to know how to use your mouse. Now, this is really simple. On the bottom of your mouse, there's a roller, generally, unless it's an infrared. Now, this is going to tell the pointer on the screen where to go. So what you'll do is put your mouse on a flat surface. If you have a mouse pad, that works really well. Now, on the top of the mouse, you have several buttons and then possibly a wheel here in the middle. Now, you're going to use the left button on your mouse the most often. So when we say click or double click, we're talking about the left button on the mouse. The right button and the wheel also have little special added functions, but we'll get into that in a minute. Now let's talk about what you'll see on your screen. After your computer boots up, your screen displays the Windows desktop, and this is everything you're going to see on the screen. Now the desktop has several basic elements. Probably the most important one is along the bottom of the screen, something called the taskbar. Now this will give you quick access to your most common Windows tasks, like starting and running programs. The taskbar has several sections. In the left corner of the taskbar is the start button. When you click it, the start menu pops up. This will give you quick access to your programs and documents, and even access to the internet. To the right of the running programs area, this fills most of the taskbar's middle section. When you run a program, let's just open a Windows Media Player. This thing appears right there in the taskbar. tells me that the Windows Media Player is running. Now, all the programs that you have that are running are probably going to be along this area of the taskbar. It's great because when you have multiple programs open, you can gain quick access to them right here by clicking on them. Now, finally, in the right corner of the taskbar is the system tray. This displays the time and lets you adjust the volume and shows you some more of the running programs. Now you have icons. Icons represent everything in Windows. When you turn your computer on, the Windows loads, you may see icons on your desktop. 
If they're not there, don't worry. Windows XP has icons for most programs in the Start menu. Once you get familiar with your system, you'll be able to put icons for your most commonly used programs on your desktop. One icon that should already be on your desktop is the Recycle Bin. This is where your deleted data is temporarily stored. It's a politically correct version for your computer's trash can. Icons can represent anything, from your CD-ROM drive to a document, like your monthly report. Everything has an icon, and icons are there to be clicked. Okay, before we move on, remember, once you push your power button, let everything load before you try to do everything else. Your desktop is everything you see on your screen, and your start menu allows access to all of your computer's programs and to Windows in general. That's your desktop. Now, let's get clicking. And here's your new best friend, the mouse. Now, there are several ways to use your mouse. We told you that you'll most often use the left button. When you click it, you perform an action, such as clicking to open the Start menu, or as we move the pointer to the bottom left corner of the screen, click the Start button. You see how the Start menu opens? Now we can move the mouse so that the pointer moves up and down the Start menu. Now, when you put your mouse over an item in the Start menu, it appears highlighted. When you click that, it's called selecting. Now, the Start menu, like most other types of menus, also have submenus. If you highlight the All programs there, the submenu cascades out. Now you can move your cursor up and down this submenu. Good thing to keep in mind is that every time you see a menu with an arrow on the right side of it, it contains a submenu. If we hover the mouse over the accessories folder, you see that submenu pops out again. Now we move the pointer down that list and click on notepad. We just open the notepad program. It's that simple. Now, there are a couple more things that you can do. If we click on the notepad, a flashing line will appear. This is your cursor, and it shows where you enter text. So I'll type a little sentence here. We'll just go up. Oh, you're going to type. Chris is a genius. There we go. Now, if I move the mouse pointer midway through the sentence, and I click, I could just start typing again. Chris is not a genius. Now, the text is entered where the cursor is now placed. So if I go back again, now let's go to the Start menu. Let's open up Accessories. And I open up our calculator. There he is right there. You notice how the Notepad program changes color around the edges there? Now, clicking also lets you select your work area. So when we were typing in the Notepad, it was known as the Foreground program because it's in the front. When I open the calculator, that became the foreground. Now, if we click the Notepad again, the calculator disappears. <gasps> there it is. Now, don't worry, it's not gone. Just remember that taskbar and the title bars we mentioned earlier? We have two of them here now, Notepad and Calculator. So if we click on Calculator, there it is again, Notepad, Calculator, Notepad, Calculator. I'm breaking a sweat. Okay, you got it now. All uh, right, now for the right button on the right side of the mouse. When you right-click, you open a pop-up menu of options. The menu choices depend on what you right-clicked on. Now, to select a menu entry, move your mouse down one of the pop-up menus and then click on your selection after it's highlighted. One last bit of information about your mouse, don't get click happy. If you give your computer too many commands at once, it could lock up on you. Basically, it won't allow you to do anything if you do that. So, when you click, give the computer a second to respond because it's got to take some time to do those actions that you told it to do. Now, if you find that your mouse is kind of sticking, it's pushing and it's not working, you may need to clean the roller on the bottom. Let me show you that. You just flip the mouse over, Turn this little disc here, pop it out. Now the ball comes out. Now, you can clean these connectors. If you look inside, they're little connectors and they can get really dirty. So you have to clean them with a Q-tip and some alcohol to make sure the signal can go through. When you're done, just pop the mouse ball back in, flip it around, and you're ready to go. That's right. So again, let's recap just a little. When you left click, you perform an action. When you right click, you open an options menu. Don't overuse your mouse. Too many commands at once can lock up or slow your computer down. And if your mouse isn't working right, try cleaning your roller. It's all you really need to know to get started. So it's time to move on and master using Windows. OK, here we go. You ready? As we said, icons are there to be clicked. So let's start clicking something. Now let's select the My Computer icon that we have uh, either on the Start menu. In our case, it's on the desktop. It opens up a window, so let's open it up. Almost every window has got the same common components. This on the top is the title bar. It runs along the top of every window. In the right corner of a window, there are three buttons. This X button will close the window when you click on it. There you go. Let's reopen the window. OK. Cool. Now that center button is the Maximize button. When you click on that, it means Maximize. The window will grow to fill your entire screen. If you click it again, 
it returns the window to its previous size. Now this on the far left here is the minimize button. When you click that, the window disappears. Oh my gosh, it's gone. No, of course not. It's down here. It's minimized down to the task bar where we left it. Very good. That's right. Now, All right. you got to understand there are other components in Windows. Uh, in every window, most windows have what they call a menu. That's found just beneath the title bar. This menu gives you quick access to many common tasks. Here we've got a file menu, edit, view, favorites, tools, help. Beneath the top menu is something called the navigation bar. This has several icons sitting there. These will help you move around in Windows. We'll show you how to navigate in a minute. Below that navigation bar, you'll find the address bar. This displays the name of this particular window. Again, we're using My Computer. And it'll allow you to navigate through your computer quickly. Now, this My Computer window also has a section on the left side with task and navigational tools. Not all windows have this section. Now, besides opening and closing a window and minimizing and maximizing it, you can also resize a window. Here's how. You're going to hover your mouse on the edge of the window. Now, when the pointer changes to look like a double-ended arrow, just click your left button down and then hold it. Now move the mouse and drag the shape of the window with it. When you're satisfied with the resizing, just let go and you're done. Now you can resize a window either along its horizontal or vertical edge, or you can do both at the same time by using the corners. Now let's make this window really small. We've made this window, there you go, too small to display all our icons. Now over on the right side, we've got what's known as a scroll bar. This means that there's viewable space beyond the window's present view. And you can scroll back and forth. To use that, you place your mouse on one of the arrows or on the square in the middle and uh, click. The contents will then move up or down accordingly. Now another way, of course, is to use that scrolling block. Stick it in the middle, click and hold, drag it up and down. Now release the button and you're done scrolling. Now, if your mouse has a wheel between the two buttons, you rotate it. It's really simple. The window contents will then scroll vertically with the wheel's rotation. So that's a window and how to move and manipulate it. That's right. Now, let's look inside this particular window. The My Computer window we just opened contains everything inside your computer. And it displays it with icons or, as you can see, folders. We have uh, underneath those folders, we have our drives. Now, we have, usually you're only going to have one drive, the local disk C colon. That represents everything that's sitting on your computer's hard drive inside your case. Beneath this are the icons for devices with removable storage, in, in which case like our floppy drive and our DVD drive and our CD drive. Those are going to be labeled with different letters. And again, it may not look the same on your computer, but this is our computer. Everybody's computer is their own. Now when you click on, let's say the hard drive icon, the local disk C colon, the window changes. This is because you told Windows to display the contents of your hard drive. Notice how the title bar changed. We had it, it said my computer before, now it says local disk C colon. Let's go back. Oh, or no, actually let's stay here. Let's click on the documents and settings folder. Double click that to open it and watch how the window changes again to reflect the contents of that particular folder, in the, like in the title bar and on the side, and then the folder's changed in here because we've navigated one step further in our computer. Now, as you can see, Windows will organize information on your computer in folders. Now, uh, my computer is what we call the topmost folder. Your hard drive is a subfolder, and documents and settings is a subfolder of the subfolder. So, my computer, my documents, stuff like that. Now, it sounds sort of confusing, but this is called a, a folder hierarchy folder tree, directory tree, basically everything just branches down like this. There are many ways to navigate through the Windows tree. You already know the method of clicking on a folder icon and seeing the folder's contents. Now here are a few more ways to navigate through the tree folders and subfolders. First of all, most windows have a navigation bar just beneath the top menu. If you click the back button, you return the window to its previous folder. So go back, I was just there. If you want to return to the same subfolder, click the forward button. Now, if you click the up button, it will display the contents of the folder one step up in the Windows folder tree. Sounds complicated, but isn't. That's right. Now, another way to navigate is to click the down arrow located at the right-hand side of your address bar. This opens up a drop-down view of your main folder tree. To see the contents of one of these folders, just move the mouse pointer down the list, highlight your selection, and then click. So that's how to move around and navigate your computer using the Windows Explorer. But you aren't limited to what's already there. You can also create folders and organize them the way you want. So let's create a folder. Navigate to uh, the My Documents folder. What we're going to do is right-click somewhere in the white area of the window. Go to New. Just 
let it cascade out, and then select folder. It's going to pop up the option where we've got a new folder. Now we can name it whatever we want. Uh, we've already got, uh, let's make, uh, we got a Kate stuff folder, so let's make a Chris's stuff, oops, stuff folder right there. Easiest way to do it. Now, another way to create a folder is to make sure you've got the white area selected. Just click somewhere in the white area, and then in your tasks pane, you're going to see the option that says make a new folder. Simply click this option, and then you've got a new folder. Name it to whatever you want, put whatever you want in there, and then press, you know, press the enter key when you're finished. That's all you need to know about your Windows directory. Clicking an icon in your start menu opens a window. To close the window, you quickly click on the X in the upper right-hand corner of the window. To resize a window, you click and hold on the outer edge and drag it to your preferred size. Now to create a new folder, all you have to do is right click in a folder and then select new folder. Easy, fun, simple. Now, let's show you how to run some programs. Oh, cool. We've shown you how Windows organizes information in a folder tree. Now let's take a closer look at your files. There are basically two types of files in Windows. First, there are files you create, like when you scan a picture, you've made a picture file. When you type a document, you've created a document file. These files are created within programs by programs that you run on your computer. Then there are program files. Now these are also called software or applications or software applications. That's right. And Windows lets you place what are called shortcuts to programs on your desktop. In many cases, Windows automatically puts shortcuts on your desktop and in the start menu when you install a program. If you don't have a shortcut for something, you can select the item in your start menu, right click on it, and then in that menu that you see, you should be able to see send to and the option to desktop create shortcut. Go ahead and click that and then once you've done that, you'll have that shortcut to that program not only in your start menu, but on your desktop too. You'll want to do this for your most commonly used programs. Let's just make a couple of shortcuts here. Well, let's do something. Yeah, there's Microsoft Excel, our spreadsheet application. I'll explain that in a second. Oh, Outlook Express. That's our the what we're going to use to check our email. Wow, you're making a lot of there shortcuts. Let's okay. make a couple. Now, okay. to run those, all we have to do is double click the shortcuts that Kate just created. Go ahead, double click on that. Look at that. It opened Microsoft Word because that was the Microsoft Word shortcut. So, this is our word processor that we have installed. You already saw a notepad, which was kind of like a word processor, but not really. With Word, you could write letters, shopping lists, and even some Hollywood scripts. Now, there's the spreadsheet program. That's that Microsoft Excel thing. It's basically a, a calculator or an automated ledger book. And inside, you see rows and columns of cells. And with this, you can calculate your finances, chart your spending habits, and even organize your recipes. Your computer should also have what's called a media player. These will play audio and video files. It'll also play a CD-ROM. So if you pop in a CD, it opens in your media player. Media players work just like your home CD player. Just press play and listen to it. Now, internet programs will let you communicate with other computers on the internet. You want to browse the web? You need a web browser program. Want to send and receive email? You need an email program. You're going to learn more about these programs later in our internet segments. Sounds good. You know, there are hundreds of other types of programs that you could purchase or download off the internet, and then you'll need to install them. Before you could use them, obviously, <laughs> you need to install them. When you install a program, it's copied from your CD to your hard drive if you're installing it from a CD. Now, they're usually stored in your program files by default. Once a program is installed, Windows puts it in that program files folder that we saw a few minutes ago. Now, before you run a program or even install it, you need to make sure your computer's hardware can handle it. Here's a quick tip on how to check. If we go back to the My Computer icon and open the window, now right-click in an open space, a pop-up menu appears. Move down the menu, highlight Properties, and then click. This opens the System Properties dialog box. Dialog boxes have clickable tabs across the top. You see them up there? That lets you see pages of information. Go ahead and select that general tab. The general page of this dialog shows you the basics of your computer hardware, your, comp your CPU, the speed, and the amount of RAM that you have installed in your computer. Write these down, because when you go shopping for more software, it could come in handy. Remember, programs are files that occupy space on your hard drive. To see how much free space you have, you can do it by hovering your mouse over the local disk C icon, Write down how much space you have. Again, this helps when you want to buy more accessories for your computer or more programs because you don't want to run out of space.
Here's how to install a program. Our digital camera came with software for photo editing, so we'll just use that. Now, if your program's on a CD-ROM, insert the disc in your CD drive, just like my lovely assistant is doing here. Lovely. Now, your system should recognize it automatically. There we go. Now, as soon as it does, see that little CD spinning there by the cursor? That means I see a CD-ROM, and it's coming. Now, an install program should start automatically. You see the hourglass there? It means it's thinking. There it is. And now, it gives you what's known as an install wizard, so you just follow along. So let's try that. Software installation. First, it'll ask you, do you want to install software? So we'll say, install. Now, it's going to go through all of these screens, and will probably ask us some questions. So let's get there. There we go. It says, all right, fine, I can install this. Here we go. It says, is this where I want to install it? Yes, I want to go in program files. That's the default place to put these. Applications should go there. So, okay, let's hit next. If you're not sure what to do, by the way, in any point during an installation, just select the defaults. They're usually right. We'll take care of everything you need. Okay, so let's keep going. We say, yes, this is what we want to install. Next. And now it says, I'm installing, so I should just hit okay. There we go. Now it'll say, please wait, and then it'll start moving files from that CD. Oh, license agreement, by the way. You'll always get this. Of course, you bought the software, so you can read it first if you want. Just click yes. There it goes. Now it's copying the files from the CD to my hard drive. See, that installation was not hard at all. So now let's see how to uninstall a program and remove it from your hard drive. Now you may want to do that if your program's old or you're sick of it and don't use it anymore. So let's just say we lost our camera or Chris dropped it. Oh, sure. Blame it on me. Well, to uninstall, all you have to do is click the Start button, select the Control Panel, and when it opens, click the Add or Remove Programs icon. A new dialog box appears. Now, under the Currently Installed Programs section, we've got a whole bunch of stuff that's been installed. And now we're going to uninstall the camera software we just installed. Not like you normally do that, but we're doing it for the sake of argument. So, we'll click and highlight the program. Then click the Change and Remove button on the right side of that dialog box. It'll ask you if you're sure you want to remove the program. Go ahead and click Yes. This will run the program's uninstall wizard nine times out of ten, and it'll ask you a series of questions. Like, if you want to remove a shared file. Now, if any other program is using that particular file, you'd click No. You'd want to keep it for that other program that you're not uninstalling. Since our camera is the only one using one particular file, we're going to click Yes. Then, press OK and close the open window. Makes sense. Some programs will come with an uninstall option built in, and you'll find that usually where it's at in the Start menu, because it'll say Uninstall the program right there in the Start menu. This will make it even easier to uninstall. If yours does, just click the Uninstall icon and follow the instructions just like we did before. Now, you may want to install something besides a program, like a printer, hardware. Now, here's how you add a printer. If your printer uses a parallel connection, you're going to need to manually direct your computer to the printer. So how do we do that? We go back into the control panel and click on printers and other hardware. Then you're going to see pick a task. Under that, click add a printer. This is really simple. You click the add a printer wizard. That starts up and it'll walk you right through the process. Now it's similar to when we installed our camera software. You just follow the directions and the printer will set up. Now, if you have a USB printer and it's connected and turned on, Chances are it's already installed. This is why USB is a really good thing. Now, those are the basics of installing and uninstalling programs. That's right. Now, once a program is installed, you can open it. It is also called running or executing a program. We've already opened several programs before. Now, let's take a closer look at opening and closing programs. Several ways to do this. If the program has a shortcut icon on the desktop, like uh, the media player does, just double click on it. That's all there is to it. Now you've opened the program, but there's another way to open the same program. If we right-click on the same desktop icon, when the pop-up menu appears, select Open. This will also launch the program. You know, you're running it, you're executing, you're launching. Same thing. Now you shouldn't have any problems here, really, but here are some reminders for installing, uninstalling, and running programs safely. First of all, when you install a program, if you're not sure about everything, just say yes to the default options of a program's install wizard. They generally will not steer you wrong. Don't manually uninstall a program by deleting the files. Don't ever, ever do that. Uninstall the program through the control panels, add or remove programs. Now, when you click to run a program, be patient. Wait for the program to open. If your computer's slow or the program's really big, it might take a few minutes. That's right. Most programs open and install the same way. It's now time to open a program and start using it.
hey, let's open a program and use it. We'll use Microsoft Word, which is a very common program. You'll probably use this one a lot, as a matter of fact. These steps will help you learn to use almost any type of Windows program. Now, this is Word, which is a word processor from Microsoft. Now, we've started with a blank work area. To begin typing, all we have to do is move our mouse into the work area and click. There's the cursor. We'll just type a couple of sentences here. Kate is nice to work with. She smells like mint. Isn't that lovely? Now we're going to edit this text. We're going to move the pointer back over to the word work area, place the over, cursor over some text, and then click and hold. There we go. Now the text is highlighted. Now just like selecting or highlighting files, you select this text, or you can double click the word to highlight it. Now if you want to cut, copy, and paste the selected text, right click on the text like we just did here, and we'll select cut. Looks like it's gone. But it's not. Don't worry. It's just gone to the clipboard. Now, right-click somewhere else in the paragraph. Now, when the pop-up menu appears, there we go, just hit Paste right there. Now, your text wasn't deleted when you selected Cut. Again, we mentioned it went to the clipboard, which is what Windows uses as a hidden virtual space. Now, you use the clipboard to create a virtual copy of something, and then you can paste it anywhere you want. Now, another way to move text around is to drag and drop it. You highlight some text and then click and hold the button down on the mouse, and then drag the pointer to a new location and let go. And that's it. Now, many programs like Microsoft Word will let you manipulate text within a document file. Most of that manipulation method kind of involves a cut, copy, paste, drag and drop, right-clicking. Moving on. Right click, right click, right click. Almost all programs have a top menu. It's located just underneath the program's title bar. Now these drop down menus contain usually, like in Word, we've got the file, and in there you'd be able to create a new document, open an existing document, or save a document. All the stuff that you would do with a file. Now moving over, you have the edit menu. And then under that, you're going to have your edit commands like cut, copy, paste. Here we've got even find. What you would do to edit the document. Moving over to the view menu is going to tell you how you want to look at the window on the screen. You want to view it uh, with a web layout, with a print layout, whatever you want, right there in the view menu. Of course, you've also got the format menu. Let's, let's go over to there. And there, you're going to be able to format the document. Like uh, if you wanted to make your font, and that's the type that's on your screen, if you wanted to make it bold, or if you wanted to make it italicized or red, you'd be able to edit it right in there under the format menu because you're formatting the document, so on and so forth. Now, moving to the Tools menu. This is going to give you access to Microsoft Word's tools. And again, a lot of programs will have the same type of functionality in, in their menu bars. But here in Word, we'd be able, in the tools, spelling and grammar, that's a tool. We've got the word count, that's a tool. All these things under the tool menus are tools. So now, flipping over to the Window menu. Right here, you're going to be able to flip-flop between all the windows that you have open. Now, this is Microsoft Word, so we're just going to be able to flip-flop between the Word windows that we have open. And we only have one. We only have one document open. But as Kate opens another window, now you see we've got two documents open. We can flip back and forth between the two using Word's window menu. Okay. We're flipping back and forth between each Word window. And finally, we have the Help menu. Now, if you need help working in a program, all you have to do is click Help. Move your mouse pointer down that drop-down menu and select the program's help file. Just click it. This should open up the program's help file. Now, programs might also have program-specific menus. Microsoft Word, for instance, has an insert menu. That lets you insert dates, page numbers, pictures, and so forth. Windows Media Player has a play menu, which gives you access to the Media Player's play functions. Now, most programs also have a button bar below the top menu. These graphic buttons give you quick access to the program's most commonly used functions. For example, Microsoft Word has a spell check button on the button toolbar. You just click it to spell check your open document. That's it. They're just like shortcuts. Now, in a program's top menu, the file menu is especially important because it gives you access to commands that will open, save, print, and create data files. Let's test it out. Sure. Now, you know, when we open Microsoft Word, it automatically created a new fresh document. Now, if a program you use doesn't do this, or if you want to create a new file, click the file, the menu, click File. Now, move your mouse down the drop-down menu and select New. To open an existing file, you would select Open from this very same menu. When the Open dialog box appears, navigate to the file you want to open, select it, then click the Open button. Now, once you create a new file, or if you open a file, you may want to save it after you've done some work. Then the program's top menu, click File, select Save As, and we'll put our file in the My Documents folder. 
it makes sense. You know, we're saving a document. Save it in the My Documents folder. Type in the name for your file, then click the Save button. And that's it. Now, if you open an existing file in a program, edited that file, and now you want to save your changes, click File in the menu, select Save, and it may look like nothing had happened, but the edited file has actually been updated on your hard drive. Now, for printing, most programs will let you print an open file. So make sure your printer's turned on, it's connected, it's loaded with paper and ink. Now, click File in the program's top menu and select Print. In the Print dialog box, select your paper type and print quality and then click OK. That's it. Your computer processes the print job and then your printer starts printing your picture or document. Now, here's something that is really important. If your file doesn't print right away, don't start clicking the print button over and over again. You're going to end up with a mess of wasted paper because it'll print every time you do that. Just give your computer a chance to perform the command and your printer may just need a chance to warm up before it can print. Now, to close a document, choose Close from the File menu. Now note that this doesn't close the program, it just closes the file. To exit a program, click File in the program's top menu and select Exit. Now, when the program window disappears, the program is no longer running, so it works exactly like clicking the program window's X button. Now, just a note here, when you go to exit or close a document, if you have unsaved work, you'll be prompted to save your work before you exit, which is handy, so just select yes or no. That's right. Now, we've been using Microsoft Word, but these commands are found in almost every other Windows program. Let's demonstrate. We're going to open Word again and another program called Excel. Now, look. When we place them side by side, these two programs may start to look alike. But guess what? You can move text from one program to another in the case of Word and Excel. It's easy. Just highlight the text you want to move, click it, and drag it to where you want it to go. We're moving this from Word to Excel. Now, besides dragging and dropping, you can also cut, copy, and paste between the programs. If you're saying to yourself, there seem to be many different ways to do the same things in Windows, you're right. There are many ways to perform the same tasks. For example, to move a file, you can drag and drop it, or cut and paste it, or cut and paste by using the right-click pop-up menu, or you get the idea. Lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's all about the variety. Now, luckily, there are many similarities between programs and the way you control programs and work with Windows. So those are the basic skills you need to work with any program. Now, just remember, always save your work. Move stuff around. You can cut, paste, drag and drop. Lots of ways to do that. And always give your computer time to execute your commands. Now, let's talk about a few different file types. We now know how to create a file in Microsoft Word. So from now on, if I go to that document, which is stored in the My Documents folder, it'll open up in Word. But there are many different types of files that you can create in different programs. Never fear. Let's open up that My Documents folder. Now, here we've got a variety of things. There are Word documents, media files, pictures, and folders. So you can tell because of the way the picture looks like. See, that's a music file. Simply double-click it, and the associated program, in which case, in this case, it's, it's the Windows Media Player, will automatically open up and play the file that you just clicked on. It's that easy. Ta-da! Now let's look at how to move your files from one location to another and how to move things around on your desktop. To move a window, all you need to do is place your mouse pointer above the title bar, click it, but don't let go. Now move your mouse to drag the window elsewhere on your desktop. When you find where you want to place it, just let go. This drops the window. Drag and drop. You may need to do this a lot if you have multiple windows open at the same time. To open another window without closing the current window, let's double click on the My Computer icon again. This will just open a second window. Just so you know, you can open as many windows as you want, but it's not really a good idea to have all your windows open at the same time. You only have so much room on your desktop and taskbar. We're going to arrange the two open windows so we can see the contents of both at once. Now, if we move the mouse over a file, let's see, let's uh, use the picture. There we go. Now, click and hold that with your mouse. You notice how a shadow icon will follow the pointer? Just move it to the other open window and then release it. And again, it's just drag and drop or cut and paste. Now, if you don't want to remove the file from its original location, you can copy instead of cut. It's the same step, essentially, but you leave the original file intact in its original folder. You can also move and copy entire folders filled with files, just like you move and copy individual files. Besides moving and copying files and folders, you can also delete them. There are many ways to delete files and folders. For one, in an open folder window, if you move your cursor over a file or folder icon, when it's highlighted after you've single-clicked 
to select it, press the delete key on your keyboard. Now a box will pop up and ask you, hey, are you sure you want to delete this file? Hey, yeah, you are. When you click yes, the file is deleted or it's put into that recycle bin. And yet another way is if you've got that common task list on the left side of the window, click after you've selected the file or folder, delete this file or folder. That's as easy as it gets. Press yes and it's gone right to the recycle bin. You can also click and drag that icon of the folder into the recycle bin. It's that simple. It's amazing. You could delete stuff. Of course, you don't want to go delete happy or you don't want to go copy happy only when you want to move stuff around the drive. Now, actually, none of these files were being deleted. They're just sitting in that recycle bin, and that's a special temporary folder that was created specifically for you in case you wanted to undelete those files. So go ahead, let's open that recycle bin. You see all the files that we've deleted, and if we wanted to uh, restore them, we could right-click on them, on one of them, and choose Restore and that would put it back to its original location. Now, let's say we didn't want any of these files that are sitting in our recycle bin. All we have to do is choose that empty the recycle bin task that's sitting there on the left-hand pane in the common task list. That's easy, but please remember, once you empty that recycle bin, your files are permanently erased. So, to restore a file that's sitting in that recycle bin again, highlight its icon, and then click Restore this file in the Windows Common Tasks list. So now you know. You know how to Move, copy, and delete files. Now, you should also know a few safety tips. Don't ever move or delete program files and folders like your word processor or commonly used software programs. They won't work right if you move them or delete some of those required program files. When in doubt, choose copy over cut. That's always safe. You can always go back and delete the old copy later. If your hard drive is very spacious, leave deleted files in your recycle bin for a while. If a program suddenly doesn't work, check your recycle bin for program files you may have accidentally deleted. Now, it's finally time to use all the skills you required to, fun part ready, access and surf the internet. Now, exploring the internet is probably one of the reasons you bought your computer in the first place. If not the reason. Yes, if not. The internet is a worldwide network of computers, and these computers talk to one another. Now, first, you'll need to make a connection to the internet, and these types of connections come in different types, meaning the physical connection you receive the information through. Now, different connection types offer different connection speeds. Basically, that's how fast your computer sends and receives the information when you're online or on the internet. Now, you'll need to sign up with an Internet Service Provider, or ISP for short. There are hundreds of choices when it comes to your ISP. Not only are there dozens of service providers to choose from, but you also have a choice on what type of service that you want. Let's talk about the different connection options you have to choose from. A dial-up connection is the simplest and oldest internet connection. People call it just dial-up for short because your computer connects through your home phone line. Then to connect, your computer dials up a number given to you by your ISP. Dial-up connections are slower than other connection types because it's hard to squeeze all that internet information through a phone line. The trade-off here is that they're the least expensive and they don't require someone to come out and install special equipment. Plus, dial-up internet service is available wherever you have access to a phone. To establish a dial-up connection, you're going to need a modem, a phone cord and an active phone jack. Pretty basic, just plug a normal phone cord between your modem and the wall jack and you're all set. Now, if your computer doesn't have one, you'll need to go out and purchase one. As we said, there are hundreds of ISPs that offer dial-up service. One thing you're going to want to watch for is that your provider offers a local dial-up number for your area, because if they don't, you could end up with a seriously hefty long-distance phone bill, and you'll want to find a different provider if this happens. That's right. Now, another way to get connected is through a cable connection. Cable connections are a newer way to connect to the Internet. Instead of using a phone line, your computer connects to the Internet via the same type of cable your TV uses to get its stations. Now, cable Internet connections are much faster than dial-up, sometimes called broadband, and they're normally connected round the clock, so you don't have to dial up every time you want to get online. To establish a cable connection, you need a cable modem, which they'll probably give you, and a network card inside your computer. These components can be tricky to install on your own, so your cable ISP will likely send a service person to install the components and establish a connection after you sign up. But be prepared to pay for the installation and the extra equipment. If you're interested in a cable connection, you'll need to call your local cable company and see if they even offer the service and if it's available in your area. Digital Subscriber Line Connections, or DSL, are another way to connect to the Internet. A DSL connection uses your phone line, but in a different way than a dial-up connection. DSL is faster than a dial-up and comparable to a cable connection in speed. 
To establish a DSL connection, you need a DSL modem and a network card. Again, your ISP will most likely send a service person to your home and install these components and establish the connection for you. DSL and cable connections can both be expensive and they're not available in all areas. But if you'd like to find a DSL service provider, you can contact your phone company and see if they offer the service. MSN and Earthlink both offer DSL service or you can just look in your yellow pages under internet service and see what local companies offer DSL in your area. Fortunately or unfortunately, there's no one method for connecting your computer to the internet. ISPs vary with connection options and specialized connection software. Your connection type plays a role in what you need to do in order to establish that connection. Generally though, we can tell you this. If you choose a dial-up, or in some cases a DSL connection, you'll need to manually connect each time you want to get online or onto the internet. This means that before you can start surfing the web, you need to click on a connect to the internet icon and enter your user information in a connect to dialog box. Then your computer will dial out and establish the connection. I know that sounds really tough to set up, but it's not, we promise. Now in the start menu, we select the control panel. In the control panel window, click network and internet connections. Under pick a task, click on set up or change your internet connection. If you haven't connected to the internet yet, this will bring up the internet connection wizard. It will walk you right through the connection process. You'll be asked some questions, and during the process, you'll be allowed to pick a provider that fits your needs. By default, the wizard offers MSN service because it's Microsoft operating system, but you can select show me other providers if you want to shop around. Now, when it comes to cost, different ISPs offer different pricing plans. Some are unlimited use and some charge by time. We recommend signing up for an unlimited use account because you always end up staying online longer than you thought you would. Don't you? I do. Now, once you pick your provider, you will then be given a dial-up number based on your area code, and you'll be asked to pick a username and a password. Just follow all the instructions. Once your connection is set up and you're logged on, you'll be ready to start surfing the web, the fun part. Let's start surfing. Okay. Okay. Sounds good to me. You know, one big essential internet program is called a browser. This lets you access the World Wide Web. This www consists of pages of information and a web browser will display those pages. Windows comes bundled with Internet Explorer, so let's show you how to use it. Netscape is another popular browser and it works pretty much the same way as Internet Explorer does and it's also free. You'll be able to download from a website once we show you how to do that, of course, using that web browser. Now, as you can see here, Internet Explorer looks just like any other window. It's got a top menu beneath the title bar. You can move and resize the window just like other programs in Windows. The World Wide Web is kind of like a city. So there are a lot of different places to go, but to get there, you need an address and sometimes a road map. To go directly to a website, if you have the address, just highlight the text in the address field. Press the backspace key to delete anything that's in there. Then all you have to do is type in your address. Let's type in uh, www.techtv.com, my favorite website. Then press the enter key. Now, a web address will tell you your computer where to look for the information you want and where to get it. Now, on the bottom here, there's a status bar. This shows you what Internet Explorer is doing. In this case, it's connecting to techtv.com and loading the page. Now, here is where your connection speed really plays a part. Slower connections will take longer to load in pages, so if you're using a dial-up, it might take a while to load. That's right. Now, interesting to note, web pages are actually files, much like normal documents, like that Word document we created. But these files on the web, these web pages, contain hyperlinks. Now, hyperlinks are usually displayed by a different color and are normally underlined. Now, you can click on these hyperlinks to access another web page or to download a file, kind of like being linked to in a hyper way, a very quick way, to another web page. So if you move down in the left column of the techtv.com front page and hover over TV shows, a submenu appears. Just like making a selection, we click and let's choose call for help. Eh, go figure. You'll hear a click sound every time you click on a hyperlink in your web browser. When you pressed call for help, you told Internet Explorer to access that web page. It's now loaded and displayed in the main window. Clicking hyperlinks is a great way and pretty much the only way to navigate the Internet. Now to help you navigate, Internet Explorer has a special button bar along the top. You click the back arrow, you return to the previous page. If you would then press the forward button, you would go forward one page, back to the call for help page, you know, the one that we clicked. Now, if you press the stop button, Internet Explorer stops loading the page right where it is, and you can always press the refresh button 
to reload that same page. Now, don't forget, Internet Explorer is a Windows program, and so it operates like many other programs we've used. If you want to print out a web page, just click File in the top menu, highlight, and select Print. Set your page size, your print quality, and then you go. Click OK, and you're done. So, when you're surfing the net and need help finding information or a particular website, because you may not know where you're looking for it at, the best bet is to use a search engine or what they call a web portal. Here's how they work. A search engine goes out and looks for all the web pages online. You can type in keywords into a search engine and it will return to you a list of web pages that may or may not contain your keywords. So let's see how it works. We'll click on the address field bar, highlight and erase the text and type google.com. Now press the enter key. The Google website will load and you'll be on your way to find loads of information. Now, there are many search engines on the web. Some of the more popular sites, one of which being Google.com, there's Excite.com, MSN.com, and Lycos.com, so on and so forth. They all work basically the same way. Now, another way to get the information you need is to go to Internet Explorer's main window and click on the search icon. When the cursor appears, type in your keywords and press enter or just click on the search button. We're going to use Google, though, here. I'll type in a keyword. Um, let's look for chocolate. There you go. Now, in a few seconds, Internet Explorer displays a list of web pages that contain your keywords. Each entry is hyperlinked and displays a little snippet of text from each page. If one of these entries looks like it contains the information you want, click on its hyperlink. It'll take you right to that website. Search engines are fully automated, usually, so they don't always return pages with relevant information. If you're not finding what you're looking for, you might want to try a directory. Search directories are created by humans. Web pages are organized by category, and then you click through the directory list to find them. One really popular search directory is located at yahoo.com. See the search field up at the top? Now you use that exactly the same as google.com, but yahoo.com searches through its own directory of websites. Now, do you see the directory below it? These hierarchical categories are all linked. Click on one to see more related categories and links to websites. So what's the difference between a search engine like Google and a directory like Yahoo? Well, search engines are automated and search through a broad slice of the web. Directories, such as Yahoo's, are human created. They don't have a link to every page on the internet, but the categories make sense and you won't find any irrelevant links. Use a search engine like Google for broad searches or use a directory like Yahoo's to browse by subject. Besides just reading information from web pages, you can also download information, music files, software programs, and so on. Instead of putting a CD in your disk drive to install something, you can just download it directly from the internet to your computer. So if there's a software title you want and you find it for sale online, or if you find a song you really want, with a few clicks of the mouse, it can be yours. That's right. Now, I have a site here that has great downloads, webattack.com. Now, usually if something is downloadable, it has a button next to it that says, download. Pretty simple. Just select the button. We're going to find it here. Oh, right there. Download. And it'll go out and it'll get the information. And in a couple seconds after it's established that connection, it'll give me the option to save the file. Right there. So I would click save. It would then save the file to wherever I asked it to save it to. In this case, it would be the desktop. And a few screens will pop up right here. Just tell it to go through. Yep, that's what you want. It tells me that the information is being transferred. Now, it says completed. If I close my browser window, I can now navigate to where the file is stored and open or install it. If it's a program that needs to be installed, once you select it, an install wizard should open up and walk you through the install process, kind of like we did earlier with the software. That's all there is to downloading. You may come across web pages or sites that you'll want to revisit. In fact, you might want a certain web page to load automatically as soon as you connect to the Internet and open Internet Explorer. This is called your home page, and you can set your home page to any web page on the Internet. Here's how, really easy. Navigate in Internet Explorer to the page you want to make your home page. Let's use techtv.com. This is so easy. All you do is drag and drop the address bar icon onto the home icon like this. It'll ask if it wants to be your home page. Just click yes. Then the next time you open Internet Explorer, your home page is automatically loaded. Mm. Just like that. Yeah, now the downside to that is you can only have one home page, but you can save your favorite web pages with Internet Explorer's favorites feature. Favorites are bookmarks or shortcuts to websites that you want to visit often. Navigate to a page you'd like to revisit. Let's use the well, extended play home page. In your browser's top menu, click favorites, and then in the drop down menu, click add to favorites. This makes the add favorites dialog box appear. Click the OK button. 
When you want to revisit the page, click the Favorites menu. Notice how your new favorite was added to the list? Highlight, click it, and your browser will automatically load that web page. It wasn't too difficult. So that's the web and how to use a browser program to surf the web and search for information and download files in a nutshell. To go directly to a website, just enter the address in the address window and click enter. To use hyperlinks, just click on them. And if you don't know the address of a site, you can use a search engine like google.com, excite.com, or lycos.com. Now, let's learn another very popular way to use the internet, email. Tell you what, why don't we send each other some email? Yeah, sounds good to me. Okay, go over there. I'm going to go over here. All right, and uh, I'll stay here. Email stands for electronic mail, and that's exactly what it is. When you write an email, you send it from your computer to another person's email address. You can also send one email to many different people at the same time. Do you have an email address? Well, when you signed up with your ISP, you were probably given one. Now, to send and receive email, you need an email program. When someone sends you an email, it sits on your ISP mail server until you retrieve it with the client or your email program. When you send email, you send it from your program to your ISP. They then send it on to the recipient. Sounds confusing, but it's not. We're going to use Outlook Express as our email client, but again, there are other programs that are just as good and will accomplish the same feat. If this is your first time using Outlook Express, you'll need to set it up before you can start emailing. If you're lucky, your ISP, the guy who came out to set up your account, did this for you when they were out there. Now, if not, here's how you can do it yourself. Now, if Outlook Express's setup wizard doesn't automatically open when you open the program, go to its menu, click Tools, and then select Accounts. When the Internet Accounts dialog box opens, click the Add button. You'll have several options here. If you want to use the email address your ISP gave you, select the POP3 option. You can also use Outlook Express to access web-based email accounts, which we'll get to in a moment. Now, type in your information. You'll need your name, your email address, the names of your incoming and outgoing mail servers, and your account name and password. Now, if you've lost your info or just plain forgot, call your ISP. They can help you get that information. Follow all the steps. Now, when the wizard completes, click the Finish button and close the window. Once your email account is set up, you're ready to send and receive email. So, let's check my email. I cheated a little and set up my email in advance, and I'm going to send Kate a couple of messages right from here over there. You ready? Oh, you bet. All right. Send away. Now, before I open Chris's, I'm sure, articulate, lovely, and well-composed email, let's take a quick look at the program. Now, like most other Windows programs, the Outlook Express program runs in a window, has the top menu bar and the button bar. It also has a sidebar down the left with the window of our mail folders. This will let you quickly access the main parts of Outlook Express. So let's click on the inbox icon. This is your inbox where you can read and reply to your received email. You now have all the tools you need to send and receive email. So let's do that. On the toolbar, you just click the send and receive button right here. A dialog box appears which will show Outlook checking your email account. Now if there's email waiting, Outlook Express retrieves it and places it in your inbox. You'll want to read your incoming mail, of course, so click and highlight it in the inbox. And what do you know? I have mail. Good job, Chris. Ah, thank you. It's one of my many talents. Now, to view this email in a separate window, highlight and double-click it in the inbox. And now it's open in its own window. When you receive email, you can also easily reply to it. Here's how. If the email was sent to multiple addresses and you want everybody on the list to read your reply, just click the Reply All button. Or if you just want the sender to see your reply, hit Reply. Now this opens the email in a separate window and works just like a word processor. Move your mouse to place the cursor and then type your message. When you're uh, finishing your reply, just click the send button. So that's how to receive and reply to email. Now let's compose a new email message. And since our friend Chris appears to be well versed in this, buddy, it's all you. Oh, thank you so much, Kate. If I go back into my inbox, all I need to do is select the new button. This opens a blank email window. Just enter in the email address of the friend you want to send it to, beside the To button. A cool little feature here is if you've set up a contact list, just click that To button and select the recipients from your list. If you want to send the email to multiple recipients, click in the text field next to the CC button. Enter their email addresses separated by a semicolon. Now, you can title your email. Just click in the text field beside Subject and type in your email title. Now, you can begin writing your email message, finally. 
When you finish, click the Send button in the Emails window. So far, we've shown you how to receive email, how to read the messages, and how to send your own replies and new email messages. But email messages can also come bearing gifts, attachments. I'll let you handle this one, Kate. All right. Now, email attachments are files that come attached to the text of the email. Attachments can be any file, a picture, a program, or a video. But your email service may restrict the size of these attachments, and you might only be allowed to send and receive small files. I'll just reply to an email here to save time. Let's find one. There we go. Here's one you sent me. OK. On the button bar of the email, just click on the paperclip icon. This opens the Insert File dialog box. We're going to navigate through the windows of the folder tree, find the file we want to send. Here's Blue Hills. It's a pretty little picture with the email. Now, I'm going to send this to Chris with my reply. And then I hit Send. So there it goes. Wow. I already got it, too. That was quick. Now, sometimes you may not get your email immediately. It can take a few minutes for it to find its way to your ISP's mail server. So I'll check my inbox again. There it is. And I know it's got an attachment because there's a little paperclip icon in the corner of the box. All I have to do is click that paperclip and a pop-up menu appears, which shows you a list of files attached to this particular email. Now, to open an attached file, select it from the pop-up menu and click the left mouse button. A word to the wise here. Only open attachments if you know who sent the email and if you know they meant to send the email. Why do I say that? Because some of those email viruses everyone keeps hearing about will spread themselves automatically, and your friend may not know it came through his email account. So be sure you know what's coming in there. Now, let's look at another type of email program, and this one will let you check your email from anywhere in the world. It's web-based email. Sending and receiving email from a web-based account is no different than what we've discussed. But instead of using an email client program to access your mail, you'll use a web browser like Internet Explorer. Hotmail is one service that offers web-based email. Yahoo.com and Excite.com also offer free web-based accounts. So let's see how to use Hotmail. It's so easy. First, you have to sign up. You'll need to sign up for an account. Now, if we go to Hotmail.com and click the Sign Up link, all we have to do is fill in the info on the registration page. Now, once you're signed up, go to the Hotmail.com website. Type in your username and my password, nobody peek. There we go. And then press the Sign In button. Now, my browser is going to update and display the Hotmail homepage. Now, on the page, here we go, we'll click on the Inbox tab. This will display your Hotmail inbox. If you have new email, click it to view it. There you go. If you want to reply or you want to reply to all, click on all of those buttons on the email page. And here they are, reply and reply all. Writing a new message is also totally easy. Just click on the Compose tab at the top of the Hotmail page, type in the address, and there it goes. Write the subject, write your text. You can even send attachments, and Hotmail automatically scans them for viruses, which is handy. Now, when you're done, just click the Send button. There are definite advantages of using a web-based email service like Hotmail. You can only send smaller files, but you can access your email from any internet-connected computer in the world. Another great feature of the internet is the ability to send instant messages. This is one of the more popular things you can do when you're online. It's one of my favorite things to do. It lets me communicate over the internet in real time with my friends. Most often, you communicate using short text messages, but there are also ways to speak with each other in audio and even video conference, if you have a webcam, of course. When you run an instant messaging program, the window shows which of your friends are also online. You can then click on their name and begin a text conversation with them. Here's how to use one. We'll use MSN. First, sign up for a Hotmail account, which we've done. Then, start the instant messenger program. Enter your username and password for your account. When you're logged in, your instant messenger displays a list of your friends and which ones are presently online. To add a friend to the list, click the Add button, and then click through the options. I'll add Kate to my friends list. So I'll type in her email address, which is computerbasic1 at hotmail.com. Now, when one of your friends is online, a little window might pop up and tell you they just signed on. If not, click on his or her name. Now, I'm going to go ahead here, bring this up, and select Chris. There he is. Now, a new window with two sections appears. Once we get started, there we go. This is the chat window. The top pane displays a history of your conversation. Right now, ours is empty because we haven't said anything yet. The bottom pane is where you enter text. Now, type some text and then press the Enter key. There we go. Hey, dude. When the message is sent, your text moves to the chat window's top history pane. 
Did you get it? Yeah, I, I did. I'm responding. Okay. Hey, dude, debt. And there it is. And that's really all there is to instant messaging. Now, one thing we should mention, though, up until now, we've shown you demonstrations with Microsoft products. But other companies also make programs which do the same things. For example, Microsoft Word and WordPerfect are both word processors. Internet Explorer and Netscape Navigator are both web browser programs. AOL Instant Messenger and Microsoft Instant Messenger are both instant messaging programs. We're using Microsoft products in our demonstrations because they're bundled with Windows XP and they're easy to use. But programs made by some other companies are also excellent. Just make sure you don't limit yourself to Microsoft products. You don't have to. Now that you're a bona fide techie, are you? Good. Then let's talk briefly about the downside of being wired. Security. Windows XP is the first version of Windows with a built-in firewall, which is a small program designed to keep hackers out of your computer. Firewall programs protect you from hackers. Essentially, they make your computer look like it's shut off. That's right. Just, I'm not here. Nobody here but us chickens. Now, however, firewalls don't protect you from someone even more dangerous than hackers. Yourself, I'm sorry to say. Viruses are small programs. They're tricky. They may even masquerade as other programs or attachments. If you click to open a virus, it infects your computer and untold damage may be caused. That's why we said don't open attachments unless you know who they're from and they know they sent it. Now, some unscrupulous people out there get their kicks by sending out viruses as attachments to email. So if you open the attachment, your computer is attacked. And a lot of the time, these viruses send out infected emails from your computer to everybody on your email address list, and you won't even know it. That may have happened to one of your friends. Now, there are three defenses against viruses. The first one is common sense. Don't open anything you're unsure of. Another thing you can do is set a security level for your browser. You go into your control panels in the control panel window, click internet options, and then click through the tabs of the internet properties dialog boxes and choose a security level you think is appropriate. When you finish, click OK. Yeah, then there are virus checking programs. Virus checking programs compare the files on your computer to known viruses. If there's a match, the program notifies you, that is, the antivirus program, or the virus checker, and then begins disinfecting your computer. Norton Antivirus is the most popular of these programs, and it works in the same manner as Zone Alarm. When Norton Antivirus is running, its icon appears in the Windows system tray. Click the icon to open the Norton Antivirus window and set its properties. Behind the scenes, Norton Antivirus checks the files on your computer. You don't see it working unless something happens, and when you do see Norton Antivirus working, you'll be glad it is, because it's removing a virus or maybe removing a virus from your computer. You hope it's removing a virus from your computer. And the last defense is Windows Update. Windows XP features a way to update its own components. This is really handy, called Windows Update. It downloads and automatically installs newer components for Windows XP. Here's how to use it. You go into your control panels in the control panel window, highlight and click Windows Update. Now. An Internet Explorer program window opens and automatically loads the Windows Update website. To begin, click Scan for Updates. To download and install an update, just click the Review and Install Updates button. Then click the Install Now button. Windows XP then automatically downloads and installs your new software. It's all very self-explanatory. Just keep your Windows Update current. When critical updates are released, and those are sometimes security updates, it's a good idea to install them right away. They will plug those holes, which may put your computer at risk. Yeah. Now, guess what? There's not much more you need to know. You already know how to set your computer up how to turn it on, how to use Windows XP and other programs. You can open, edit, and save files. You know how to connect to the internet and use programs, surf the web, send and receive email. And uh, all that's left is learning how to change the settings on your computer and how to shut it down. We're almost done. All right, home stretch. Mm -hmm. Now, mm. before we shut the computer down, let's change some settings. Almost everything in Windows is configurable. That means you can alter the folder tree, the files, and the settings of almost anything. That includes the appearance, the taskbar, the start menu. It can all be really personal, and that's the whole point. Here's how to change some settings. To start, let's go into the control panel, since that's where you can change the settings on most of your computer. The control panel window has two views, a new Windows XP only category and a Windows standard classic view. To switch between them, just click switch to in the control panel Windows left side list. We're going to use the new category view. If you want to change the look of your computer, click on the appearance and theme button. 
Now, what about changing the background picture on the screen? Well, that's really, really easy. You just click the desktop tab along the top of your display properties dialog box. Now, here you have several choices for backgrounds. Click and highlight them in the background list, then preview them in the monitor. You can also select your own pictures. Just click the Browse button. In the Browse dialog box, Find your picture in the Windows folder tree, select it, and click Open. Once you click Apply, it just becomes your background. Ta-da! What about uh, changing the actual look of Windows? Oh, yeah, you can do that. All you have to do is click on the Appearance tab, and in the drop-down menu, click the Effects button. In the Effects dialog, click and check the box beside Use the following method to smooth edges of screen fonts. In the menu below this, choose Clear Type. This makes fonts on your desktop look much, much, much smoother. Very nice. Now, uh, if you're having trouble seeing small icons, click and check the Use Large Icons box. That's pretty straightforward. Then click the OK button to accept the changes. If you click on Date, Time, Language, and Regional options, you can make regional and time changes. If your computer loses track of time, click Change the Date and Time and make your changes. Ba-boom! Those are some of the settings we want to keep. We've given our computer quite a workout. We connected it, booted it up, turned it on, ran programs, connected to the internet, and went through all the settings changes. Let's turn it off and give it a break. The most important thing to remember is to never push that power switch to turn off your computer. If your Windows is using a file at the time, the file might get corrupted, if you, especially if you didn't save it when you try to shut down your computer. So let's learn how to log off and shut your computer down properly. All right, just yank the power cable out of the wall, right? No, that's wrong. No. When you want to shut your computer off, open the Start menu and then just click Turn Off Computer. It's that simple. Now, if you want to restart it, click on Restart. Now, the other option here is Standby, and this puts your computer in a low power sleep mode. Don't ever interrupt the log off, shutdown, or restart process. Just let Windows do its thing. If something bad happens, like you trip over the power cord, as we mentioned earlier, by accident, let Windows perform a hard drive check. Do not skip through it. Uh, you've now learned pretty much everything you need to work your computer. Oh, well, I guess that's it. I think we're done. Are we? That was not so bad, see? No, it wasn't. Not and really. now, see? Now you mastered the basics, you'll be ready to move on and try out some of the more exciting aspects of the wired world. Yeah, and if you're still feeling a little overwhelmed at this point, good news. We have set up companion pages for this video on our website. You can view our pages at techtv.com slash computer basics. That's a forward slash, by the way. That's the one with the question mark slash. Here you'll find extra information on the topics we've covered on this video, as well as links to even more information. Or you can always rewind this tape. Now, if you're ready to move on and try out some more advanced techniques, we have several more books and videos available from the Tech TV Learning Series. You'll find them online at techtv.com shopping. Well, that's it. Good luck. And happy computing.